Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we have some news to share with you all and talk about Mm -hmm. first let's start with an update from last week last week we talked about storm 0558 and the compromise on exchange online there was an update from microsoft about expanding cloud logging to give customers a deeper security visibility and so we'll link that blog within our show notes but basically over the coming months Microsoft is going to include a wider set of security logs for all the customers at no additional cost. There's something called Microsoft Purview Audit Standard, and customers who have that will receive detailed logging of email access and 30 other types of log data that were only previously available at the premium level subscription. And as well as Microsoft will be increasing the default retention period from 90 days to 180 days. We had mentioned last week that the logging was only for 90 days, and now that's going to be changed to 180. And the licensing requirements for audit standard are pretty wide as far as if you're a Microsoft customer, you probably have this. So basic um, business standard, M365 apps for business, uh, 365E3, and the education, government, A3, G3s, uh, frontline workers, Office 365, E1, E3. So essentially, if you are a customer, this is the standard logging that's included. And now a lot of the logs that were previously available at the premium, including that mail item accessed one that was talked about last week, which was the one that the federal government saw some anomalies in, that tipped them off to the compromise. So that's happening. And basically I think it's a good thing. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's something that Microsoft has done previously where they've included things that were part of a higher level subscription. And now either through this breach or, I'm sure that had some sort of bearing on it, but in partnership with CISA, we are now including these logs in the standard. As we mentioned, anytime we talk about Microsoft on the show, Andy and I are both employed by Microsoft. Uh, Obviously, we're involved in the decision-making process about this change. And Andy, you're absolutely right. If you look through the history of Microsoft 365, there have been products that over time initially were in kind of the E5 tier and moved down to the E3 tier over time. Audio conferencing, as an example, with Microsoft Teams, that's where you can have a phone number to dial into as opposed to just the VoIP access through a web link. That became available to E3 customers during the pandemic, as an example, and that has carried forward. It continues to be accessible to all E3 customers. And um Defender for Endpoint, Microsoft kind of carved out part of the capability of the the Defender for Endpoint product, which is the TVM EDR solution, and brought some of the web management and some of those capabilities to E3 customers in a new P1 version of it. And so this kind of continues that trend. And I spoke last week about, hey, you have to consider a cloud scale. You know, there are costs involved with with doing additional logging that's more computationally expensive. There's more storage. And even a small amount of storage adds up when you're doing millions of users, right? Well, if you think about the cost of storage, it has continued to go down over time. If you think of the cost of compute, it has continued to go down over time. So it makes sense that what was perhaps once untenable to offer to the entire base, you know, financially became more accessible over time. And this may have been the impetus to push that over the edge, but still it makes sense that, that things like that will happen. Um, one other thing to couple other things to think about with this. Number one, this does not mean all of the capabilities of purview audit premium have come to standard. 
these 30 additional log types have, including the mail items accessed, which I think is the one that's top of everyone's mind in light of that incident. Um, so there are still differences there. You should refer to the documentation to make sure if you're still wondering, like if there was a premium feature you were looking at in the past, it may still be premium only. Like there's longer retention periods available uh, only for premium customers measured in years, plural, as an example. And then one other thing, uh, full mailbox auditing, as far as I know, is not on by default in Exchange Online. At least it wasn't back in the day when I was an exchange administrator. And so you do have to go set a mailbox, do a set mailbox uh, command, commandlet in PowerShell to enable auditing in all your mailboxes. And this change will not change that. So you do have to have auditing enabled and you do have to um, have that already in place to start to take advantage of this. And then one last thing, this is a rollout over time. It's going to be over many months before all customers are enabled. So if you do have a need or a want to get that now, the way you do that is, is to get audit premium. And that would give you access to this immediately. Otherwise, if you are waiting for it to come to audit standard, as part of like, like Andy said, E3, A3, G3 licenses and a lot of other flavors as well, that will be a rollout over time. So just a couple of uh, things to be aware of there with this news. Although, of course, very positive, right? Great news um, for all Microsoft customers. And I think uh, everybody appreciates that this was able to happen. So it, it's, a, it's a positive thing um, that, that everyone has access to this. It's obviously... Um, Never, never great that it takes a, a security incident, you know, to drive change sometimes, but um, that's what security is all about. It's a learning process. It's iterative. It's always getting better than you were the day before that. And I think this is a way Microsoft's trying to be better than they were the day before. The next thing I wanted to talk about is threats. And I know sometimes we infuse social media like Mastodon and Twitter into our discussions. But mm -hmm. I truly believe it's one of the most important topics we can talk about because communication on current InfoSec events really happens over these online communities. And since Elon Musk has taken over Twitter, that has really taken a dive in engagement, in stability. And so threads being released was really interesting to me. It is headed by Meta and Instagram. It's kind of a, an extension of Instagram, which the uh, parent company is Meta or Facebook. And it blew up over the last few weeks. And it reached millions and millions of users uh, in a very small amount of time. But now I find that everyone is still spread out over multiple platforms. There are people who are on threads. There are people who are on Twitter. There are people who are on Mastodon. And for me, it's very hard to find all those InfoSec people that I need to follow in order to keep up with current trends and news and maybe compromises that are happening in real time. I still think that Mastodon is probably the best right now for a lot of the InfoSec people because they really haven't found their way over to Threads, even though Threads, I think, is more mainstream because it's super easy. A lot of people have Facebook accounts. It was like one click to like create a Threads account, but it is headed by Meta, which tradition traditionally has not had the best privacy policies and sharing of your data. <laughs> so probably not where a lot of infosec people are going to gather there's also some features that are missing which they're going to include over time specifically like the ability to just show who you're following's timeline rather than the algorithm hashtags are not available so you can't follow like trending topics and so there's a little bit of features that need to be included but i also think that a lot of infosec people will probably stay away from it but you never know the other thing is, is that it's also built on ActivityPub, which means that it has the capability to join the Fediverse. And we talked about this in Mastodon, but essentially it's built on the same protocol that Mastodon is built on, which means that threads may be able to federate at some point. It isn't right now with other Mastodon servers. However, there's already been a lot of talk on some of the Mastodon 
threads that I follow, no pun intended, that moderation is going to be very difficult for threads because there's already been people who have joined that platform that have traditionally spread conspiracy theories or have racist views. And so they're not going to want threads to federate with their instance if they're bringing that over. We talked about Mastodon being a haven for a lot of folks who were marginalized and finding a community there. And you're able to defederate from instances when you need to. And so if threads is not going to be moderated in a way that's compatible with other instances, those instances will defederate and not allow users to communicate back and forth. So a lot to come there. I just think it's interesting because social media is so important for me when it comes to finding current events. And now we have a brand new platform that's very similar to Twitter. Although I still don't think it'll take the place of Twitter, but time will tell. Don't you mean X? Twitter? <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> so threads is super interesting. I think in large part because... I think most of us had come to terms with the fact that there wasn't going to be a new great social network. I mean, ultimately social network only has value. If you get that critical mass, you have enough scale that the people you want to engage with are on that service. And if you don't have that, it's not appealing. And so for the most part, we'd kind of made peace with the fact that it's really hard for anybody else to gain critical mass And all the existing networks have done a really good job at this point of kind of walling themselves off from allowing other networks to kind of like import your graph, import your friends list into other services. You know, in the early days of like Twitter, you could find your Facebook friends that were on Twitter. Like, and that disappeared years ago, obviously, when when they became really competitive. But I, I mean, those days aren't coming back. And so what was so interesting about threads was you had this built in social graph that you had already built on Instagram and the implementation was kind of weird because it uses Instagram's namespace. So it uses your same user identity. However, threads has a separate sense of following. It doesn't just import everyone you're following and everyone who's following you from Instagram. It's a new thing. Now it had like one click, like follow everyone I follow on Instagram. And I think in the early days of the service, it was kind of a dopamine hit to be like, who accepted your follow, who followed you back. It was kind of exciting. Um, but what what's happened is threads has shown like it, it showed this tremendous like user signups curve. However, the Mao or, or monthly active users is declining very rapidly. And I think that's because people are signing up for it. And again, either their friends aren't on there or the feed is kind of weird because like you said, it's algorithmic, it's non-chronological, it shows people you don't follow and it's good. Like I found it compelling. Like even after I had viewed essentially all of the threads from people that I followed, it was showing me interesting conversations and I like that, but it felt chaotic in the sense that like there wasn't like something I could follow. Like when I get on Twitter, my Twitter is basically like people who tweet about sports and people tweet about computers. And so I can catch up on whatever the story of the day is, whether it's the women's world cup or it's what's going on in tech right now. It's Elon wants to rename Twitter to X and what a joke that is. And threads was just like coming into a party and hearing like random conversations around you and like not being able to make sense of it. You could tell everyone's having a good time, but like there wasn't like an overarching theme to it. So that was, that was odd. And yeah, I I do see the the meta thing will absolutely for the purposes of this show, I think scare off a lot of folks because people have major objection with their privacy policies and with how they operate and with how they monetize their services and all that. Um, They're the only ones really at this point that could do a new social network though, like, and really gain critical mass. But because it's basically seen as like, it's another Twitter, you know, getting over that hump of like, well, why would I use other Twitter if Twitter is still a thing? unless you, you just are the kind of person who's drawn a line in the sand. I'm like, I'm done with Twitter. 
And I think most of us have really groused and complained about the Musk era, but have continued to use it. I mean, I know for me, Elon killed all the third-party clients, and I was a devoted third-party client user my entire Twitter existence, from Tweety to Tweetbot, and now I'm back to using the native client, which sucks, but I still do it because like, maybe I'm an addict. I don't know. But Threads is an interesting story, but the next story is to your point, okay, they have some features to add. They need to get there quickly. Are they going to get people to launch the app again? Because it sounds like a bunch of people signed up and like checked it out and like, oh, this is cool, but I'm going to go back to real Twitter, not like this, this thing that wants to be Twitter. And they haven't come back. And I'm guilty of that. Like when Threads first came out, I checked it a lot the first three, four, five days. I don't think I've launched Threads in at least two weeks. Um, so, I mean, if, I'm a, that's an anecdote, but take my anecdote for what it's worth. I think there's other people in that same boat. And lastly, I think um, I'm not sure if there's a way to to do automation with threads, like if there's an API for it, if I'm a social media manager, can I automate posts on it? Can I post to multiple services and cross post? Those are some of the things you need to really gain that critical mass too. And if the only way to do it, because as of right now, you can't even do it on the web, you have to literally open the mobile app to do it, that can limit growth too. So threads, I think was super interesting and will continue to be something worth following, but they may have already missed the boat. It may already be too late. Despite this rapid out of the cannon growth they've had, I, I think, I think they lost it already because people opened it and checked it out and like, Oh yeah, this is, you know, it's missing this, this, and this, I'm going to go back to real Twitter. And that was kind of the end of it. And Oh, Oh, last, last point. Sorry. I know I'm rambling a little bit. Mastodon, the Fediverse integration there with threads, a lot of people have questioned now with how big threads got and how fast it got there, if they'll even follow through on that. They always said they were going to do that, but now it's like they kind of don't need to. And then there is the question of if they do, you know, some Mastodon admins have basically said they will defederate them preemptively. And you know, I, I sarcastically said, Andy, in one of our chats, I said, you know, these Mastodon admins are going to display their commitment to openness by blocking meta at first sight, you know, preemptively. Um, I, I think if they do show up, we at least need to see how they act and how they behave. Because although meta has rightly taken a lot of criticism for how they have moderated or not moderated Facebook, Instagram, on the other hand, has been strictly moderated its entire time, um, arguably too much so. Uh, their, their algorithm is very quick to flag things that are not actually offensive, but Instagram has always leaned very heavily with an absolute iron fist of moderation. So it'll be interesting to see where Threads comes in on that continuum. Is it going to be more Facebook-style moderation that's kind of more laissez-faire? Or is it going to be iron fist moderation like Instagram? And I think that's still to be determined. Yeah. Interesting. Great call outs there, Adam. All right. Let's dive into some Microsoft Entra news. So lots to talk about here. We mentioned it last week, but Azure AD is now being rebranded as Entra ID. And it's going to join a multitude of Entra solutions as part of the Entra family, Entra permissions management, Entra verified ID, Entra ID governance, and Entra workload ID. Most importantly, the capabilities and licensing plans, sign-in URLs, APIs, all will remain unchanged and all existing deployments, configurations, integrations will continue to work as before. The name change will hopefully be completed by the end of 2023. That's the plan. And there's no action needed from any customer so that's the key takeaway right here so a lot of things like azure ad free or azure ad premium p1 azure ad premium p2 those are all going to be renamed to microsoft entra id free microsoft entra id p1 so get ready for those changes none of the technical details behind it will change it is simply a marketing brand name change and for me I think I speculated, and I think Adam, you speculated as well, that this was something that was probably coming. We aren't 
behind all the different marketing things or decisions. But I think when Entro was announced last year and Azure AD remained unchanged, we were like, well, it's probably just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's a good thing. Just brings everything under the Entro umbrella. And now there's less confusion with on-prem Active Directory and Enter ID, which is a completely different service in the cloud, cloud native. Microsoft marketing always takes a lot of heat for almost anything they do. And a lot of the times it's very deserved. Uh, naming products is hard in general. People have strong views and a lot of product names that ultimately became beloved. And I'm not saying this is going to be a beloved name or anything like that. But if you look back through time, people were very critical of Nintendo Wii. You know, they're like, oh, you know, made jokes about male genitalia and stuff like that. And ultimately, it wound up being extremely popular, right? Or the iPad, people made jokes again, like referencing feminine hygiene products. And again, an extremely successful product. So product naming is not an exact science. Although, Sometimes we've dodged a few bullets. Did you know, random anecdote, as long as we're talking about product names, the iMac, Steve Jobs, that was not his first choice. And he actually kind of had to be overridden by the rest of his executive leadership team. He wanted to call it the Mac Man, like in reference to like the Walkman. And that was the oh. name he was hell bent on. Steve always idolized Sony, by the way, forever and ever. You read anything about Steve, he loves Sony. And so it was like an homage to the Walkman, the Discman. He wanted to call it the Mac Man. Um, and it was like, this is so stupid. I don't know why he likes this name. And they talked him off the ledge and eventually got him to love it. But um, anyhow, that said, what Microsoft has done here with product names as Microsoft security and compliance and identity businesses have grown way bigger than they ever started to be. There's, there's product families now, whereas there weren't before. And so you kind of need brand names to tie that whole family together. And so earlier in the conversation, we talked about audit and we both said purview audit, purview audit standard, Pur purview audit premium, purview is that brand all around compliance related solutions. Entra is the brand for identity solutions. Defender is the brand for threat protection. Intune is the brand for endpoint protection. Priva is the brand for privacy management. Viva is the brand for employee engagement. So I like this change, actually. As someone who has been an identity specialist in the past at Microsoft, and I used to talk about Azure AD and give demos of it all day long, that's all I did, I would get on the call with customers. And I'd say two things up front. Number one, this is not just for Azure. So ignore the Azure part of the name. And I'd say, second, this really has nothing to do with on-premises Active Directory. Okay, well, now we've thrown the whole name away, right? Like I just basically said, the entire name, Azure Active Directory, is bogus because it's not just for Azure, although it's built on Azure. Um, but it's not built on Active Directory at all. In fact, it's not a legacy solution at all. It's cloud native. Uh, it's built for the cloud from day one. And so I'm not sad to see this name go, even though it was something that was a huge part of my professional life for many years. I think this is a better, more descriptive name. And also I noticed, and I just caught this now, and this is so pedantic, but I thought there was still... Microsoft Entra ID Premium P1 or Premium P2, the premium part's gone. Um, looking at this graphic, Andy, you put in the show notes, like Azure AD Premium P1 is now Microsoft Entra P1 or Entra ID P1. So the premium part has just gone all together. So anyhow, I like the change. I do. Uh, and again, I know who signs by paychecks, but I find this is just a lot easier when you hear Microsoft Entra, you know it's an identity-related re solution. And then there's a whole family of identity-related solutions. So um, we went through growing pains with this on the Defender side of the world where people say, oh, yeah, you know, customer wants to talk about Defender. Okay, which one? <laughs> I think we're going to get that now too. So, you know, you as dear listeners, uh, you can be ahead of this curve. You have to be more specific. Entra what? Like Entra ID, Entra external ID, Entra ID governance. So make sure you're specific when you talk about it. But um, yeah, a good change overall. I agree. 
Okay, more intro stuff. This one was lost in the noise because there were so many main things like the name change. But I really like this feature. It is in preview right now. It is called Restrictive Management Administrative Units. And I think this will fit a lot of UK use cases that some folks will have in their organizations. So what Restricted Management Admin Units are is a new RBAC feature in Enter ID. And you're able to place sensitive objects, either being users, groups, or devices, into a Restrictive Management Administrative Unit meaning that your tenant level administrators, your global admins will not be able to modify them. Only administrators that you explicitly assign to the scope of the admin unit itself will be able to make changes. So really powerful because it can lock out your tenant level admins, your global admins. So a couple of situations that was in the documentation that some orgs might find useful. And these might ring true for you. So you want to protect a sensitive user account like a C-level executive from being able to have their password or MFA settings changed by a regular help desk administrator. So put those into a restrictive um, administrative uh, unit and only the admins that you designate in that unit will be able to modify those C-level executives. Or... You want to ensure that certain user accounts, security groups, or devices from a specific country can only be modified by designated administrators from that country. I get that all the time mm-hmm. from customers. They have you know, APAC separated out as a business unit. They only want those administrators to be able to do that. You have Europe countries. Um, Certain countries have different privacy levels. Only those admins should be able to modify users from you know, those countries. Like Germany, I know, has very strict privacy laws. We had to set up you know, specific German administrators who like, lived within the German boundaries that only had access to the German citizens. So this is, for me, it definitely rings true. Mm-hmm. And then finally, something like you have specific security groups granting access to sensitive data and you want to restrict who can modify the membership only to a small set of administrators. So I think this is a great feature. Take a look at it. The documentation will be in the show notes. It'll walk you through on how to like get started with it, but it is a preview feature, and I think a lot of organizations will find this to be very helpful. Absolutely. I, <laughs> I feel very, I don't know the adjective, but geeky to be so excited about like a new RBAC style policy, but when it's something you've heard so many customers ask for, and there's so many use cases this can help out with, and it can make the lives of so many administrators easier, it's really exciting. And I was thinking back to, in my days in IT, I often did support the senior leadership team at my organization, just because I was the exchange administrator and you know, everything's email. (laughs) Ultimately it's always email. And they had like a a technician who was assigned just to the senior leadership team. And they, this person um, was a tinkerer. They would like go in and mess with stuff. So I would love to be able to like lock them out. I'd be like, no, like only tier two, tier three system owners can make changes on behalf of C-suite. Uh, you know, nobody at help desk level is touching them. So that just like jumped out of my chair. And then all the ones you're talking about with some of the geographic limit restrictions that orgs may want to implement. I know for a lot of folks listening to this uh, show, that's going to be really helpful. So definitely check it out. Finally, two new services were announced a few weeks ago. One was called Entra Internet Access, and the other one was called Entra Private Access. Again, these kind of fell under the radar. I even mentioned them to a peer of mine, and internally, they were they didn't even hear about it. So, they're two new services. They're both in private preview now. One, the Entra Internet Access is a secure web gateway solution that will integrate with M365 identity and it will extend conditional access policies to network conditions. The other one is Entra Private Access and that is a zero trust network access or SASE solution 
secure access, secure uh, security edge. Um, you know, that will help reduce operational complexity by replacing legacy VPNs and offer more granular security. So EPA will have the ability to enforce MFA on legacy protocols. You'll have adaptive per app access. You'll be able to configure a broad range of private IP addresses, subnets, and fully qualified domain names. Um, so these products, to me, remind me very similar to like a Zscaler internet access or Zscaler private access. In fact, they have very similar names. The, I, I took a look at the documentation, which actually is very, very fleshed out. And Entra Internet Access has the capabilities for forward proxy policies, which is very similar to like Zscaler and other proxy solutions that will forward to a web proxy in the cloud. You know, call it what you will, a gateway, a, you know, whatever. Um, and then there's also web filtering that's built in. Now, there is web filtering that's built into Defender for Endpoint today if you're using that. But a lot of people go out and buy like a Zscaler or like Barracuda or something else, Palo Alto, in order to filter out things a little bit more granularly. I haven't been able to check this out because I'm not in the private preview. But I assume this is going to be a little bit more fleshed out than what's built into Defender for Endpoint, which is just by categories. All you can do is just say, I want to block gambling. I want to block uh, pornography. I want to block you know, social media. So those are just broad categories without the ability to add any exceptions. I'm hoping that this will be more fleshed out. My guess is it's going to be. And then EPA, I took a look at the documentation real quick. What I'd like to do is have a separate show eventually to do a deep dive on both of these things because I think they're going to be uh, really interesting. But EPA is actually uses, from an architectural standpoint, the same app proxy connector that you might have used before if you have been using app proxy and you know the architecture is the same you have to install the connector on a server that has access to the applications that you're trying to reach but the the way that it works is a little bit different than app proxy which is usually only web apps so either port 80 or 443 uh, rendered over a web page um, the private access policies are different and can get scoped uh, much more granular than app proxy can. And we got this question right away during one of the internal sessions, which was, you know, is app proxy going to get deprecated as of right now? Which I can't read the future, but the PG has assured me and, and the rest of our internal folks that were on the call that application proxy is not going anywhere and will still be used for certain situations, like, for example, if you don't need the client app installed. So right now, one of the things that is important to know about these two things is that it does require a separate app on the client device in order for it to work. Eventually, I think they're going to try to integrate it. My guess is with the Defender for Endpoint product that's built in, but it does right now require a separate client. So app proxy is great because you don't need a client at all installed on the client device in order to access it. You just need to authenticate to your M365 account through a web page. Um, so to, in order to join the preview, you're going to want to go to intro.microsoft.com and go down to the, um, the solution on the left-hand side and then enroll in the preview if you can. You'll basically notify and say, hey, I'd like to join the preview. You need to have at least... Enter ID P1 or M365 E3, which I think so far the the idea is to roll it in through uh, M365 E3 licensing or Enter ID P1. However, in the documentation, it did say that that could change, and when it goes GA, there might be some sort of separate licensing. But everything that I was told is right now it's going to be included with the M365 E3 suite. So that's kind of cool. If you haven't gone and checked out entro.microsoft.com, that's the new portal for all Entro things. And I honestly had not checked that out until right before this call. And I was honestly a little bit shocked to see how well it is put together. So you have security.microsoft.com, you have compliance.microsoft.com, and you have entro.microsoft.com. And entro.microsoft.com is the whole shebang on all the different identity things is your identity center. And I 
because I don't really focus on identity too much anymore in my day to day, it's not something that I normally go to. But having seen it right before the show, I'm definitely going to dive into it tomorrow and throughout the week and learn a little bit more about that because it's just not something that I've had any experience with in the last few months. But definitely check that out. I think they were really inspired by the Intune having a separate mm-hmm. portal as well. You know, what, what used to be called Microsoft Endpoint Manager or MEM, which is now all the Intune stuff. Um, that was kind of the first product I can recall to really just be like, we're going to have an entirely separate portal. Even though we used to live in the Azure portal, we're just going to do our own thing. And I, I like the idea of that. I think creating that isolation helps you kind of know what task you're there to focus on. Um, and also because a lot of it admins are very aligned by task. It's like, here's your portal. Here's your portal. Here's your portal. Everyone gets a portal. Um, and you know, I, I think it's a little bit of a, uh, a, div- a divergence from that old, like single pane of glass thing. But I think we need to recognize that different tasks require different tools. So I'm supportive of it. Um, Cool stuff. I'm excited to learn more as well. I'm excited to do a show about it as well and agree. This has kind of flown under the radar. Initially, we are going to reveal this in late June, which if you know, Microsoft is near the end of our fiscal year. And they did move that to early July instead to a sigh of relief from many people. Uh, But also in early July, because it's Microsoft's new year, a lot of people take time off early in the new year and, I just think we haven't had a chance to kind of all get together and and geek out over this and kind of figure out what it is, what it does, and what are the best use cases for it. But I'm excited to learn more as this moves from private preview to public preview to generally available. And, you know, as it goes along that path, let's definitely do a show and revisit. Absolutely. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAWZERO and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.